No comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This is uh, this is automatic transmissions test seven, right? You got that? Okay. Uh, now then, who can tell me what a sensor is? Tell me what a sensor is. Device. If you were going to describe it to somebody that really didn't know, now Einstein said if you can't describe it to a six-year-old, you don't know it. It gathers input and sends it to a uh, PCM, a TCM, PCM, something like that. That's a pretty good. Somebody else give me an, an, uh, a definition of that. Sense, um, signal. It gives off an le uh, electric signal. No, you know, I'm gonna shut up. It's, uh, it's, like, it's used like a scale. It's used to measure right, right. Um, maybe oxygen. That's smooth. Yeah, I mean, you're actually taking a measurement and you're actually delivering it to something that's going to act on that measurement or, you know, make a decision based on it. Yeah, communicating. Or it's just going to reflect what that is, like a, a temperature sender for your gauge is just going to drive that needle. That's basically all it's going to do. The temperature sender for the engine controller is going to cause the engine controller to make certain decisions based on the temperature. So if you were to write in that box a device that monitors a condition, and modifies an electrical signal in response to changes in the condition. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's that. A device that monitors a condition and modifies an electrical signal in response to and changes to changes in the condition. Temperature, movement. Give me a sensor that. Uh, re, give me a. Or give me an example of two sensors that record movement. Wilson. Uh, wheel sensor. Crank sensor. Wheel speed sensor is a good one. Which one? Crank sensor, that's basically speed and position. When I, when I say movement, I mean just think about the throttle position sensor. The G-switch? Huh? Yeah, the G-switch probably would. Yeah, the G-switch, but the throttle position sensor is going to... The brake, uh, the brake, ABS brake system. ABS brake system would be like your wheel speed sensor. And that kind of thing. Or what about your... Uh, we were looking at the ABS on this um, Oldsmobile yesterday. And Abby, do you remember when you had that uh, scan tool... There was, uh, it was telling us when the brake pedal had traveled 40%. Remember that? That's a movement thing. What about the gas tank sending unit? It's movement, yeah. of the, it's movement of float arm based on fuel levels. Okay, they, we've beaten a dead horse on that. We're picking pepper out of the popcorn. Okay, solenoid. What is a solenoid? Give me a, give me a uh, definition of a solenoid. Wait, where do you get solenoid? Uh, I'm just asking a question. Um, yeah. What would you, what's a solenoid? Like like sort of, but what's basically if you got if you're going to take a electromagnetism and turn it into movement, you know, so, like if you're going to put a power and ground in there and something's going to change, mm -hmm. this little this is a solenoid here. A fuel injector is a solenoid. You got a coil, you got a core. When you put power and ground in there, something's going to happen. That magnetism will say make something move. That's basically how that works. And a transmission, the solenoids typically will be, yeah. if, you'll, if you take a solenoid and you're, like you put your, uh, you'd be surprised what mechanics will do with their mouth. You know, put a mouth on it, shh, blow through it, energize it, thoom, and it stops. I mean, it actually blocks a port when you put power and ground to it. And when it blocks a port, pressure goes up and it moves valves and things happen. See what I'm saying? That's how solenoids work. Okay, what about a switch? A switch is something that you flip to turn something on and off. And it can have a steady current, or it can be one of those switches you can raise up and down. And well, that would be a potentiometer. Oh. All right, but a switch, the switch, the first answer was close. It was it's either on or off. It interrupts the circuit, interrupts or completes the circuit. Uh, like, you know, if you flip that switch over there, the lights are going to go off and on, right? Mm -hmm. What is a thermistor? Somebody tell me about a thermistor. Something temperature? Like it. It's going to change... Um, resistance in response to temperature and basically if you've got a thermistor Adam really did some creative drawing up here and, and no wonder he didn't erase anything he had no eraser is that something? Yeah, All right. I, like, why you not have I ain't got an eraser I just had to use my hand okay I gotta get me another eraser from up front they got boxes of things I've already never think to get one I was up there this morning okay so uh, if you've got a thermistor watch this this is what we're gonna do We've got to come out of our engine controller, and especially we're going to come out of our engine controller with a, and this is going to be no matter what, okay, we're, going to, we're coming out of there, and we've got a current limiting resistor, like that, right, 
okay and we're going to measure right here we're going to be putting out about 4.6 volts here it's going to be just under five we're going to go into our sensor and we're going to go through this thing which is actually going to be like a the symbol is like a little zigzag thing with an arrow and then we go back to the engine controller into ground right? and i didn't quite draw that the way i should have but here's your sensor and your sensor is going to be either measuring transmission fluid temperature in this case engine coolant temperature intake air temperature sensor now watch this as a negative temperature coefficient sensor operates backwards from the way you would think it's actually going to get less resistance the hotter it gets which is backwards than what you'd expect you'd expect the, the, cool, the sensor to get more resistance the hotter it got the hotter that one gets the lower that voltage is going to go so as this thing here gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the voltage that is, re that is measured and recorded by the engine controller is going to get lower and lower and lower. And I've got a really good little uh, graphic on that that's on this other computer, but I had not moved that program over here, so I can't show it to you on the big screen. But you're going to get where I'm going. The hotter it gets, huh? What does the resistor do again? The resistor gets, it gets less resistance the higher the temperature goes. As a matter of fact, I can take a... A res uh, ohmmeter and put on one of those resistors. You see that board right up there that stand up with all that stuff on it? Now there's two thermistors on that board. One of them's the engine, an engine coolant temp sensor and the other one's an intake air temp sensor. And so when I take those, I hook up a meter to those or I hook five volts up to it and ground on the other side. You're going to see the voltage. This resistance goes, it's going to short that voltage out. As it shorts it out, it don't short it completely out, but it shorts it lower and lower and lower. As it cools off, it goes higher and higher and higher. Now think about this is NTC, NTC. These questions are what you're going to find on ASE tests and stuff like that, NTC. Negative temperature coefficient. That's, and now positive temperature coefficient is like a light bulb. The hotter it gets, the more resistance it has. That's why when you do your electrical calculations, you may see that it's got one ohm of resistance, but when you power it up and do the math based on ohms law, it's going to have like six ohms of resistance because the hotter it gets, the more resistance it has. Anyway, just, and that's positive temperature coefficient. You don't hardly ever see a sensor that's positive temperature coefficient. You know, it's just not, not happening because the resistance gets greater with heat. Okay, now everybody got that? A device that changes its resistance in relation to temperature fluctuations. Now, we've got a potentiometer. Alters its resistance according to the movement of mechanical parts. I've waved this in front of the camera many a time. This has got three little wires in it. This little thing here has got three wires in it, and it's got a movable center right all right so if you take three of them wires uh and you put i think i got another one here maybe movement all right watch this this is your potentiometer i've drawn this before all right watch this imagine this it's almost like a gas a fuel tank since you got three wires one of them is going to slide up and down Okay, we're going to put a straight 5 volts into this one. We're going to put a ground into that one. And, at the, and this is our little input wire. And it's going back, all of them are going back to the PCM, but this is the one that's being red. And when that moves up and down, the closer it moves to the 5 volts, the higher the voltage is going to go. The closer it goes to ground, the lower the voltage is going to grow. When you program the computer and say 1 volt is idle and 4.5 and volts is wide open throttle, and it can be anywhere in between. It knows how fast you're moving the throttle, how high you've gone with the throttle, whether or not you're at idle, all kinds of cool stuff, based on this little sensor right here. And it's on the edge of the throttle. And what's the difference between it and a rheostat again? A rheostat is actually going to carry current. A rheostat is like what you got for your uh, dash lights. So current is going through there. Now a rheostat is basically, the, the long and the short of that is, a rheostat is like this. There's nothing on this side except a little button. All right, and this right here is going to be B plus. Okay, this right here, imagine a light bulb right here hooked to this one. Okay, and this is grounded. Now, as this is way over here, all of that current's having to flow all the way through that before it gets to the light bulb. You notice I don't have anything over here mm -hmm. on that one. Now, as you move this farther toward the B+, plus, that light's going to get brighter. That's a rheostat. A potentiometer is a potentiometer is supposed to send a signal. A rheostat carries a load. You got me? Yeah. All, right. All right. That's the difference between it. That was a good question, Daniel. All right. Now then. Uh, so, okay. You know, everybody's happy with that. So, 
What kind of device is the engine coolant temperature sensor? Thermistor. What kind of device is the throttle position sensor? Potent. Huh? I can't say the word. Potentiality. Thank you. Hey, he did pretty good. Thank you, Mr. Cookie Monster. Pot All right. Potentiometer. There you go. Uh -huh. yeah. Potentiometer. Potentiometer. Oh, incidentally, <laughs> this right here, if you look on there, Daniel, that's a rheostat right there. That's where you turn the headlight knob and it goes up and down. I mean, you can basically see that on there, but it doesn't have but just two wires. Basically, a potentiometer has got three wires and a rheostat has got two wires, but they're similar in operation. All right. So the transmission control module or a powertrain control module typically turns on a solenoid by doing what? Sending a signal? Well, it's going to have to, well... Let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, yeah, you're going to have a... There's a couple of ways it can do it. Okay, right here, I've got this movable core, right? And I've got this solenoid wrapped around that movable core. Okay, this is usually, on Ford cars, you're going to have B-plus coming from your E relay. You know, when you open the hood on one of these Ford cars and you turn on the key, the red wire that's going to the idle air control and the injectors and all that is powered up by the EEC power relay. It turns everything on with the EEC power relay except the ignition coil. It's turned on by the ignition key. Okay, whenever the computer decides to operate any of those solenoids, which these are actuators like fuel injectors, transmission solenoids, this kind of thing, you know, or any of the solenoids that it uses to operate EGR or anything like that, it's going to ground those. It'll either go turn them on steady or it'll go click, 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 or, you know, it puts a little bit more current to them. But the long and short of it is the PCM is typically grounded, and it's going to feed a ground in there. And I, just, I do that kind of screwy. I should have actually showed ground completely coming from the bottom. But the long and short of it is that's usually the way it works. But let me have a caveat there. If you're working on something like a Nissan RE401 transaxle, or I mean transmission, like in a hard body pickup truck, those transmission solenoids are hardwired to power. I mean, excuse me, hardwired to ground, and they're powered by the engine, by the controller. So it's not always, they're usually, most people with good sense like to use the ground. Why do they like to use the ground to make and break a circuit? Because it doesn't make as much of a spark or a voltage spike as it does when you're breaking the power side. Got me? So it's a little, you're a little less likely. If you have, if you designed a little set of points to, to go back and forth and you used it a lot, every time you're opening and closing it, it's going to make a spark, isn't it? Bzz, 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 bzz. Now what does that do when it makes a spark? It ionizes those connectors to the point to where they get eventually sort of like burned up. And then it gets where it doesn't work anymore. Now, if you had the same circuit wired up on two different boards and you started flipping those switches off and on, and one of them was switching ground and the other one was switching power, and you turned them off and on an equal amount of time, like in a laboratory. Let's say you had a little machine made to turn them off and on. Uh, the, the long and the short of it is the one that was switching the ground would last a lot longer than the one that was switching the power. Now, in the case of a PCM, it doesn't have moving parts that are going to make a spark every time. It does. It's got a little transistor that's a semiconductor, and so the transistor's got a base, which will be like if it's an NPN, it's going to have send a ground whenever you put power into the bottom of it. And so that's basically, it's going to basically break and make the uh, ground, but the positive is what triggers it. It's got three wires going to it. That's what a transistor does. There's an NP, a PNP, which is going to switch power when you put ground into the base of it. And that's what's going on on the circuit board in the engine controller. It's going to use that kind of stuff. So there's not, you don't have, a, it's not like you got little points here that are making spark every time you open and close them, but there's still a difference in how long they'll last. Although they can build circuits that'll, you know, take care of that. Anyway, I sort of went on about, but understand the solenoids are typically, the, if you want to get this answer right on this one, usually the solenoid is grounded on your fuel injectors uh, or on your transmission solenoids or on any of the other solenoids that are used by that. The, uh, oh, and relays. You know the windings on your relays, these little relays here? You're typically going to have the relays going to be hardwired to power, and then they're going to, the engine controller is going to put ground out to this, usually. That's most of the way, most of the time the way it is. All right. Technician A says electronic transmissions use no mechanical components to modify line pressure from the pump. B. Technician B says line pressure is produced by the pump in an accumulator. 
How in the world do you get line pressure? How do you get any pressure in any system, any hydraulic system that's got a pump? Uh, okay, let's talk for a second. Let's talk about a pump positive displacement pump. What does that mean? Whatever's coming in is going to go out. You know. Now, what's an example of a pump that you use fairly regularly on your car that's not positive displacement? Wait, never mind. Wait, don't answer. Never mind. <laughs> uh, what about the windshield washer pump? Yeah. It's got a little impeller. What about the water pump? It's not positive displacement. It can whirl around in there even if there's no no fluid moving. But if you've got like a the uh, any kind of a pump that's positive displacement, uh, if you're going to build pressure in a circuit, you're going to have to have like we talked about before a pressure relief valve, like a you know a pressure regulator valve with a spring. So it's got to squeeze that spring in order to open up a spill port, and that's the amount, the amount of the strength the strength of the spring determines how much pressure it's able to produce. Even if it's a positive displacement pump, if there's no restriction, there's going to be no pressure. You get me? You're going to have to have restriction to have pressure. Got that? So, so let's back up. Technician A says electronic transmissions use no mechanical components to modify line pressure from the pump. Well, let's think about that for a minute. Is the Would you say, as you think about it, that the pressure control solenoid is a mechanical component? It's got a mechanical part, doesn't it? Because you're actually going to be moving something with that solenoid. So there is a mechanical modification there going on. It's just triggered electrically. Furthermore, if you ever see a situation, I've mentioned this before, let's say you plugged in your scan tool and it gives you, like on the Jeep, uh, there's a transducer that tells the computer what the pressure is. And then the, the computer actually modifies the pressure based on what that feedback transducer has. And so if you look at, and on your scan tool, you're going to look and you're going to see a pressure target of let's say 120 psi but what if your pressure target is 120 psi but your transducer is reflecting only 60 psi and it's actually trying its best to bring that pressure up that's telling me either one of two things either the transducer is telling a lie the pressure is actually up there where it's supposed to be but the transducer is not telling the truth or the pump is not able for some reason to bring that pressure up to that level you got me if you're, if you're looking at your scan tool data stream and you see a target that's not being reached, there's a reason for that, and that's what you're supposed to go looking for. You know, How many of you guys ever had the idea, that had heard somebody say, uh, we took this thing over to such and such a place and they hooked it up to the machine so it would tell them what was wrong with it? You ever heard that? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, and that really doesn't happen. You know, I mean, I wrote an article about that one time, the ultimate machine. Well, the ultimate machine is us because <laughs> we're the one that has to figure out what's wrong your scan tool may tell you a code it may tell you it's running lean it may tell you there's a problem with your transmission solenoids but you got to get your hands dirty and gather some more data other than what that scan tool is telling you with the exception of if you worked on 7645 cars just like this one and all of them have had the same problem when you got that code you can pretty well feel like that's what's wrong with it and a lot of people that are wanting to do this kind of work nowadays are wanting to just, you know, not even get their hands dirty, plug a scan tool in, change a sensor, and get paid the big bucks. That sounds good, but when you get out in the real world, it ain't that simple. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that you got to do to figure it out. Okay, anyway, that one there, the pump and an accumulator, you know, would that be right or would that be wrong? What do you think? What is an accumulator? Somebody tell me what an accumulator is. This is pretty important. Maybe it would be something to accept overflow. It builds up pressure in order to keep the line equalized and releases that pressure in order to provide more to one end. Yeah, it gives, excess, it gives excess pressure somewhere to go, basically, and it also stores it to use later. You know what I'm saying? Or an accumulator can actually cause the pressure to cushion the application. You know, if, you're, if you don't want to... If you're shooting fluid into that compress, I mean into that uh, drum, and you don't want it slamming those clutches in, you on the you off the side, you tee off of that thing, and you go to a little uh, piston that's got a spring behind it, and before it can apply that drum, it's got to fill up that accumulator and squeeze that spring, and then when it gets over there to that drum, it's not going to hit quite as hard. See, that's a lot of what accumulators do. Uh, how many of you have talk, heard of somebody putting a shift kit? Okay, so what's that? What's up with that? It's just a different clutch. It's a better clutch. 
Well, basically what you're doing is you're going to change the strength of some of the springs in your accumulators on some of those, yeah. and you're going to drill out some holes a little bigger in your separator plate so that the fluid will go through the quicker, and it's going to have a more firm shift, which is a good thing because it doesn't, you know. Now you can put a different uh, gasket on the uh, valve body. Sometimes you'll do something like that. There's, yeah, there's, a lot of a different, there's a lot of different shift kits, and these transmission, you, there's a guy that uh, bounces around all these dealerships up here uh, in this area, like from Elba and over here. Uh, and his name, uh, his, his last name is Buck, but uh, he's got lots and lots and lots of certifications in heavy diesel trucks and cars and everything else, you know. And uh, he's, his forte is transmissions. I mean, that's what he likes more than anything else. I mean, and he's got eons of, so what he does, he's a diagnostician from what I was able to determine. He bounces around from dealership to dealership when they're having trouble and he helps them diagnose. And he doesn't have to do a lot of the work. He just says, okay, do this, this, and this. It's kind of like what I do with y'all, you know. Like I'm telling uh, 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 Webb and uh, Daniel, you're going to transmission out there. You know, that's, <laughs> you know that's, that's what you do. He's basically the one that says, this is what we've decided to do, and this is what we're going to do to go to the next step. You see what I mean? He's a sharp cookie. They use him at a lot of different places. He gets passed around from pillar to post, but he also gets paid good. So if you get to where you're really good at figuring out what's wrong, that's when you get paid the best, you see. All right, now then, when the engine's under high load, the line pressure is relatively what? You're going to go with B on the last one. Yeah, well, we're actually going to go with B yeah, on that last one. It's sort of. I mean, not really. I would say neither if it was me, but just put B and you'll be good. Okay, when the engine is under high load, the line pressure is relatively what? No, the line pressure is going to be higher when you're under a high load because you want your clutches and all to apply. Oh, Furthermore, wait, hold on. What was the thing? I know something's, when something's, when the engine pressure, when the engine loads high, something is low. Vacuum. Vacuum, vacuum is low. That's and when vacuum is low, the pressure is down. Now, remember what I told you about governor pressure? Governor pressure goes up with speed. Line pressure goes up with load. So if I'm going deep into it, my line pressure is going to oppose my governor pressure. You see, the governor pressure is going to ship, uh, push, put it into the next gear. But if I wanted to hold the next, if I wanted to hold that lower gear for a while, I'm going to push against governor pressure and make him have to work harder to get up to that point. So he's going to eventually overcome line pressure as vehicle speed comes up. But your, but line pressure and governor pressure are going back and forth like this. Now electronic transmissions, it's a, you know, it's basically a, a numbers game with these solenoids and all, and the, the transducers and everything. Okay, the purpose of an accumulator, I've already told you, right? It's basically in most cases going to soften an application and that kind of an automatic transmission. Why is a PWM solenoid different from an on-off solenoid? Now, that is an important question. A PWM pulse width modulated solenoid. One, it's like a comparison of a digital and analog, kind of. Well, yes and no. The, the on-off solenoid is digital, and so is a pulse width modulated solenoid. They're both digital, but how many of you guys understand pulse width? No. You understand duty cycle? That's like uh, your fuel injectors, right? Yeah, pulse width is a zone of fuel. Injectors. So if I take a given amount of time and I've got a 50% duty cycle, that means the uh, wh whatever I'm operating is going to be half the time it's going to be open and half the time it's going to be closed, right? If it's a 20% duty cycle, it's going to be on 20% of the time and 80% of the time it's going to be off. Okay, now pulse width modulated solenoid. There must be Georgian in my air working, but uh, that sounds like Derek's truck. But anyway, the uh, pulse width modulated solenoid um, is actually going to get the more of a, uh, the, the higher the percentage of the duty cycle is with that pulse, the more that solenoid is going to be closed and the less it's going to be open. If you got a 100% duty cycle, it's going to be wide open. Now, they got these variable force solenoids uh, that control the uh, pressure in the electronic pressure control solenoids and a lot of these transmissions have got well, actually the more current they apply to that solenoid the more it moves a little plunger it's almost like that idle air control on the forward you know so the more power you the more current you supply to that thing yeah, but if you look at the way it does it it's basically you know got a sawtooth signal but the more it puts in there the you know the more you're like on the idle air control if you apply a straight ground to that trigger wire it's going to open that thing wide open and hiss and carry on. And if you uh, take all of it away, it's going to be a 0% duty cycle and it's going to be closed. So just whichever way the thing is designed. 
Uh, so anyway, basically, pulse width modulated solenoid is going to have several different. See, on off is either dumping or blocked, and a pulse width mod modulated solenoid can have partial. It can modulate between on and off so that it lets some or some more and a little more or all of it or go anywhere in between. It's sort of almost like, but you were really close when you said it's like the difference between analog and digital. It's not just on or off, even though it is a square wave signal. You know, so if you got pulse width modulated, you're happening so fast that you're changing your pressure. Um, did you guys ever get around to doing on that GMC truck with a uh, scan tool, uh, line pressure manipulation and that special thing? Uh, that's basically changing the pulse width, you know, on those solenoids. All right, the PCM turns solenoids off, off and on based on what? Right. Speed, what about the inputs from its various sensor speed and otherwise, you know, temperature? And driver demand. You know, whatever the driver is deciding, I mean, is trying to uh, get done, the PCM is going to be paying attention to engine load speed. It's going to be paying attention to your foot, you know, and how fast you're applying the throttle, how deep you're into it, what, how fast you're going, uh, and that kind of thing. And say, now, now uh, Daniel, uh, this is where you were headed a while ago. Uh, a drop in engine vacuum is measured, as measured by the manifold absolute pressure sensor indicates what? A drop in engine vacuum means, you said it a while ago, that's what you were talking about. We were just talking about it. High engine load. Yeah, high engine load is low vacuum, Yeah. basically. Yeah. Uh, or if you've got, for instance, a uh, catalytic converter stopped up, it'll have low vacuum, you know, too. Uh, even if it doesn't have a high load, it'll have low vacuum a lot of times. But that's right, uh, high engine load uh, is low vacuum. All right. Uh, so... All right, everybody, uh, everybody pretty well happy with that? You, yeah. under you understand stuff now that you didn't know before you came in here? A lot more. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments? Is there anything? Let me ask you a question right quick. Is there anything that you leave here some days not understanding just because you want to get out of class and you don't want to ask a question because you're afraid I'll talk a lot more? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? They say, well, I don't really understand, but if I ask a question, we'll be in here another five minutes, and I want to be gone now. You ever have that? Yeah. Not, not, not because you, you're going to ask another question or you're going to talk, but like, it, like when I was working on that Nissan and I wanted to get finished with it, mm -hmm. I, I just really wanted to get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just wanted to get it done and everything. But, but uh, sometimes, if you, uh, like you, sometimes I've had instructors before that when we go to dealership school, we would be in class all day, every day for like five days or four and a half days. We have 30 minutes in a shop at the end of the week. Now, if that ain't a drag, imagine yourself sitting here eight hours every day listening to somebody talk all day long, showing you wiring schematics and telling you about stuff and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's dealership school, man. Now, some dealership schools have got more hands-on than others. I mean, I'll grant you that. And when I used to go to Chrysler school up there in Jeep school, you know, I, I was in Jeep. I was in Atlanta more than I was at the dealership. It seemed like right after we got a Jeep franchise. I went to every kind of Jeep school they had up there. But the long and the short of it was, uh, that particular guy that was teaching at school, uh, we would almost be done for only, everybody wanted to get done a little early and head out, you know, if we could. And uh, there's one troublemaker that I was sitting next to, uh, whenever you could tell the instructor was winding down and he was just about to let us go. He was going to, it wasn't me, but he was going to say, he started to ask a question and you could tell if he asked the question, we were going to be there another 20 minutes because the guy was going to launch into a long, you know, whatever. And uh, so he started to ask a question, and everybody looked at him kind of alarmed, and I put my arm around him, and he looked at me, and I went, <laughs> you don't want to go there. <laughs> so he got, but he was doing it just because he knew it would trip everybody's triggers, you know. It was so funny. But the guy kept talking about fuel filters. He says, now... You can't use these, you know, this crummy little rubber hose on these fuel filters and all, because it's got like 50 pounds of pressure and it'll bust the fuel filter and you'll have a big fire and all this kind of stuff. And every, you know, a little plastic fuel filter. I'm sorry, that's what he's talking about. Little plastic cheap fuel filters from the parts store. He's afraid somebody's gonna put one of them on there and it's gonna bust the fuel filter. And he must have said that eight times in that class. And every time he said something about fuel pressure, this troublemaker boy would say. Can I use a cheap plastic fuel filler? No! <laughs> I, got, I got so tickled at that. <laughs> and 
It was like the instructor wasn't even catching the fact that this guy was <laughs> asking him this obvious question that he knew he was going to say, no, you know. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's just, let's see if we can.